Well, U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen is rejecting recession fears, pointing to the strong labor market and easing inflation. Priscilla Sims Brown is the CEO of Amalgamated Bank, one of the only unionized banks in the United States. And she joined Walter Isaacson to discuss its commitment to social and economic justice and the state of the economy. Thank you, Biana and Priscilla Brown. Welcome to the show. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. We've been spending this past few months worrying about a recession, about hard landings, everything else. And last week, we got some great economic news. Inflation is pretty far down. Unemployment is down. As somebody who runs a great community bank, do you think we're in for a soft landing and a safe economy now? Well, I won't hazard a guess, Walter. Many have done it. Um, but I will say say that the indicators are, are good, not only those that you referenced, but also anecdotally what we're seeing with our own customers. What are you seeing with your own customers? How are deposits going? Uh, deposits are going well. We're basically flat um, on the quarter, which in this environment is a good thing. Um, but more importantly, we're also seeing real encouragement among our, um, our own customers, a, a level of confidence that gives me hope. Do you think they have the confidence to like take out loans, start businesses, grow again? Yes, I do. Uh, I think, you know, in the case of our customers, you're talking about change makers, uh, people who are doing good in the world. And uh, whether that be related to climate or affordable housing, um, these are things, these are projects that are really critically important to our society. And our, our customers are as enthusiastic as ever about getting those things done. You talk about your customers being change makers, doing good, doing great projects. You're a hundred year old bank and yet you're a bank with a purpose. In fact, you're a banker with a purpose. I've followed your career. Tell me why Amalgamated's different. Well, I'm glad you asked. It's an exciting story. Uh, you're right. Amalgamated was started by a group of clothing workers. Uh, they had formed a union. They couldn't be banked. So they decided to start their own bank. And that was a hundred years ago. And uh, for that long, we've continued to care a lot about workers' rights, but we also care about the rights of all people who are put in vulnerable positions. And so uh, we think about society and what's best. And uh, as a bank, where it's appropriate as a bank, we get involved. And by getting involved, what do you mean besides traditional banking activities? Well, we also think about those things that the financial services industry should and can do uh, to alleviate problems uh, in the world. And um, so that started for us with climate. We've done quite a lot of work. Uh, a third of our lending is climate related or sustainability related. And we go from that to making sure that we are actively involved in setting the standards by which uh, financial institutions report their activity, their their path to net zero. Um, we've done something similar in terms of getting involved and sort of punching above our weight as relates to things like um, uh, women having access to reproductive health care, uh, as relates to eliminating the use of financial systems for gun crimes and other crimes. Uh, these are all things that we think uh, are appropriate for a bank to do, and we, we get involved. So you say you get involved in all these things, reproductive rights, guns, everything else. To what extent do you have to say, we're going to take a little bit of a hit on our bottom line or the amount of interest rates we pay? Well, look, you know, for us, the story is a pretty good one. A uh, hundred years ago, this was an experiment in how banking could be done well. Uh, how you could do good and do well. Now, 100 years later, we think the experiment is proven. And it's proven for us in, in our, uh, our earnings growth as a bank. So what we do for shareholders, but also as a B Corp, uh, we care as much about what we do for other stakeholders. And so um, we see the, the success of this strategy um, in the progress that our, shareholder, our stakeholders make, including all of our customers. But do you think people are attracted to the fact that you're doing good and they Absolutely. want to be an amalgamated for that reason? Absolutely. Absolutely. Our customers tell us they like to know where their money sleeps at night. And it's uh, they're happy to know that it's sleeping in good places. They don't, again, they don't have to worry about whether or not we're doing something that's against their values. 
Um, this is this is aided by the fact that we are so transparent. And and actually, Walter, I mean, in that way, we are also we also enjoy a luxury that many institutions don't have. Um, we don't get as concerned uh, as others may about any form of of uh, malcontent among customers because we are so transparent. There's a great book by Matthew Desmond called Poverty by America. And one of the things in it that struck me is that black or Hispanic families are five times more likely to be unbanked. What do you do? I know that's part of the mission of Amalgamated Bank to fight racial injustice and things like that. What are you doing in that regard? I'm so glad you asked about that because I think it is incumbent upon us in the banking industry to be focused on the wealth gap. And that wealth gap for black and brown people is, is way too, too huge. Um, and there are a number of banks doing a lot about it. What we're doing right now is a series of conversations with change makers in this space and with individuals who are affected by this space to, to try to find where's the white space, what, what isn't being addressed. We know that some of the institutional processes we've had in place for a long time, while perhaps not intended to be, are certainly discriminatory. And we are having a discriminatory effect, I should say. So we want to address that. And one of the reasons, frankly, that we are reporting this week very strong earnings and, and we're reporting uh, great success is through the work that we're doing with underserved communities, whether those be people serving um, uh, this population or whether it's the, the, the population itself. One example of that is some of the um, investing we've done with funds that are specifically set aside for black and brown communities and for entrepreneurs in those communities. Um, another thing that we think is really important is you, you've seen a number of uh, larger banks and other asset managers setting aside specific programs um, to enable those who are coming into the workforce um, to have access to capital. We think access to capital, both at that initial point when you're trying to buy your first home and at that second point, which is when you're trying to expand your business. You've seen success in your business in a limited way. You have lots of demands. You want to expand it. You don't have access to capital to make that happen. We're looking at solutions to that problem. Let me read you a statistic I find interesting, which is that research shows that Americans in 2021 would charge $11 billion in overdraft fees, and 9% of account holders pay 84% of those fees. And those are customers who usually have balances of less than $350. That feels like a tax on the poor. You know, how can banks make sure that there isn't a tax on being poor when you go to a bank and that the poor don't get exploited? Look, I think there's a lot in that answer. One is we have to educate people in the way they're using these accounts. It's a travesty if the fees you're being charged on an account are multiples of the balance in your account. That means that you are using this account as a, as a way of getting a payday loan, essentially. You're taking the money out knowing in many cases, and we do see that there are people who do this an excessive number of times. So what's happening is they need access to funds right away. They don't have another access. So they knowingly will um, uh, create a situation where they're getting a fee for the use of that money, right? And that has to stop. We have to be able to educate people because whether you take the fee away or not, they're still not managing very well. And we have to provide education to, to assist in that. We do that not only directly, but we do it indirectly by supporting organizations that are providing that kind of information and, and uh, education and literacy, financial literacy to customers. That's where it starts. It also has to continue through, through to our policies and practices on how we charge fees and recognizing the problem and communicating with customers. This is another reason why community banks are so important because they know their customers and they have the opportunity to engage where they see there are issues. You say you, that customers love the fact the money's sleeping in a good place. 
Also, I assume it's not sleeping in bad places. Let me take an example. They may not like money going to gun manufacturers or gun transactions. Tell me what you do in that regard. Well, you know, it's interesting. I, like almost every American, I have a number of legal gun owners as family members and friends and even in my own home. Um, and so we don't take a position around uh, whether or not a gun owner should be a gun owner. We think that the Second Amendment is important. What we do, though, is we do want to see the eradication of using financial services systems to commit gun crimes. That's the distinction we make. And again, we think that's the right swim lane for a bank. Um, right now, we have a problem in this country in that, and in, in fact, it can happen anywhere around the world, in that um, illegal activity using credit cards for the purpose of buying guns to do something wrong um, is hard to identify. It's hard for us to um, report this suspicious activity to authorities. And so we've taken it upon ourselves to try to address that. In the past few days, we've seen the earnings reports from the big banks. They all came out in the past week. They did a little bit better, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, than expectations. It looked pretty good for the big banks. Over the next week or two, we're going to see community banks reporting. Is that a trend that's going to continue, or is this something special to the big banks this quarter? Well, it's going to be hard. It's hard for me to answer that uh, directly, but what I will say is that uh, we, as a, we're a bank that's in four major cities, so we're considered national, uh, but we do work all around the country. And we care a lot about the smaller banks, the community banks that we, uh, we also like to support. Uh, we think that they serve a very important purpose on Main Street in America, um, that this is the bank that supports the entrepreneurs, the local entrepreneurs, and knows them very well. And I think whether you are a large money center bank, whether you are a mid-sized bank like us, we're 125th bank out of 4,000, um, whether you're us, whether you're smaller or whether you're larger, we need this, this uh, ecosystem of uh, financing organizations to be able to uh, sustain the economy in important ways. And so uh, we certainly hope to see very good results coming out of the community banks uh, that will report. And you're right, it sort of goes in order of size. You've seen some of the big banks report. You'll see us and others uh, reporting now, and then you'll see this, the smaller banks reporting. Uh, this spring, Silicon Valley Bank, uh, the First Republic Bank failures, people were worried that this was going to hurt mid-sized banks and community banks, yet things have they stabilized? It seems they have. Well, I think what people are starting to realize is that this really is not about uh, equating size with quality. Uh, in the case of Silicon Valley Bank, you have a fairly large bank uh, that was affected, 200 uh, billion. That's, that's not a small bank. Um, and yet, I think uh, in, initially, the initial reactions were uh, that flight to quality meant flight to size. What people have come to realize, I think, in the weeks and months that have passed is that actually um, what's important is that banks are acting responsibly, that they're making prudent decisions to protect um, their policy, I'm sorry, their shareholders and their customers. And, uh, and so that's what I think is starting to be reflected in the results that you're seeing from banks. We heard Senator Warren say, right after Senator Elizabeth Warren say, after this problems with Silicon Valley Bank and others, that it happened because there weren't enough uh, correct regulations on mid-sized, smaller, and community banks. Is she right? Are there more regulations? You're a mid-sized bank, so you're in the middle of those two things. Do you think the regulatory regime is correct at the moment? If not, how would you fix it? Look, I think. Um the process of regulating financial institutions is always a dynamic process. Uh, there are always going to be changes in the economy and changes all around us uh, that will affect uh, what is important to do from a regulatory perspective, whether that be uh, esoteric new instruments coming into the marketplace, which banks uh, have to decide whether or not to participate in, uh, whether that be economic forces, both the U.S. and global, affecting the, the 
uh, progress of a bank toward its own aspirations around risk and growth. Um, these things are happening all the time. And uh, I can only tell you that we are regulated by four entities and uh, all four of them are quite actively engaged uh, in looking at how to adjust to these dynamic changes. Let me ask you a personal question. Uh, your family is from Ethiopia. I think from uh, what I've read, you grew up on military, U.S. military bases in Germany. You really didn't spend a lot of time in the United States or come until you're about age 14. And you said that's when you experienced racism for the first time. Tell me about that and how that's affected your career. Actually, the first time I understood that there was racism was when I was uh, coming to the U.S. Uh, for summers. And I came in uh, when I was nine years old and just had an experience where someone reacted to me uh, because of my race. Um, how does that color my experience? Look, I think I think we're all acutely aware of who we are and we bring our identity into everything that we do. The way it has colored me is that I understand um, that race and other artificial symbols that we carry around and, and are there for us um, don't tell the full story. And uh, it doesn't tell my full story. And I know it doesn't tell your full story. So my job is to make sure that in the role that I play every day, I'm looking beyond these things that are artificial. And it can be race, it can be age, it can be gender, or it could just simply be the style of uh, someone's uh, communication. Um, so I, th that's my job. My job is to make sure that I'm, I'm getting past those and, and trying to find a way to bring people together to, to talk through issues with very different perspectives. It's also colored uh, the way I show up. Uh, I make it a point to show up just as I am. I make it a point to talk the way I talk, to correct myself when I find myself uh, being a bit of a chameleon and, and acting like others. Um, I also think it's really important for me to acknowledge where um, where these issues have impacted me and have impacted others or where I and call it out where I see it happening. Priscilla Brown, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. It's great to be with you, Walter.